Boom. Howdy, fam. Anthony Dream Johnson here today. I'm going to be your host for the Redman Group, episode 174, founder of 21 Studios, the 21 Convention, the 22 Convention, 21 University, the Patriarch Convention, 21 Summit, co-founder of the Redman Group, and 10,000 other things on the internet. Appreciate you guys tuning in. I know it's been a few weeks since I've done the show. Been very busy preparing for the upcoming 21 Summit in Orlando. Uh, coming to Orlando, Florida, October 14th to 17th. That's a Friday through Monday. Magical Super Bowl, the Manosphere, four-day event. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be insane. 16-year anniversary of 21 Studios and our events. Now, before we get into today's show, with our special guest, Coach Noah Ravoy, who's been on the show several times before and has spoken at the 21 Convention back in Poland in 2019, I want to show you guys today's sponsor, 21 University. Visit the link in the description right at the top. 21studios.com slash mobile or 21university.com. You can get our free app on the Apple Store or Google Store, the Apple Play Store or Google App Store. It's free to join, free to download, 30-day free trial. It's pretty dope. Then if you want to stay a member long-term, it's 20 bucks a month or even 16 a month if you do the annual. On top of that, I want to make sure you guys know about 21 Summit. I'll be there myself, of course, as the founder. And this speaker will be speaking at several of the events, uh, including the Patriarch Convention for Fathers, and the 22 convention for the females. 21 Summit's an umbrella event that contains three events. The 21 convention for men, I'll be speaking at that one. Noah will be speaking at the Patriarchs event here on the left with Michael Foster on the uh, cover here. And then the 22 convention is actually for women only. You cannot be a dude and go to that. You gotta be a birthing person to go to that. And likewise, women are not allowed to go to the 21 convention or the Patriarch. Uh, either this one's for fathers, the Patriarch, and the 21 Convention Classic is for all men over 18. Check out the events, link in the description, 21 Summit, meet myself, meet the upcoming, upcoming speaker here in today's show. You can also bring a friend free for a limited time and save on early bird tickets, all kinds of good stuff, super dope. Uh, you can even use the 22 Convention for babysitting your wife, kind of like babysitting, you know, like daycare and you go to the gym. You can go to 21 Convention or Patriarch and then you dump your wife off at 22. No problem, bring friend free, kind of the whole kind of deal. Coming out to the event, it's amazing. Best event in the world for men. It's awesome. You should get a ticket. You should be there. Take action. Get off your ass. Get off the internet. Stop scrolling on fucking TikTok or whatever the fuck. And come meet us uh, face to face. Shake our hands. And don't be a beta male. Be an alpha male. Now, without further ado, and this five minute ad campaign to promote our events and apps and all kinds of fun stuff. Please let me welcome to the show, Mr. Noah Ravoy. How you doing, Noah? Thank you. Thanks for having me on. And thanks for having me on so close to the convention because I know this is a super busy time of the year for you. So you're working hard for this. I don't think people realize how much hard work goes into one of these events. It's not rent a place and then invite some people. It's a lot of hard yeah. work and you really do good work, Anthony. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate it. And yeah, it is crunch time. We got about 41, uh, 41 days to go to the event. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, 40 days and 22 hours, 41 days. So yeah, it is crunch time. It's uh, a lot of work. It's kind of like, I've been thinking about lately, and I think you'll understand this. You're an online entrepreneur mostly, but then you'd also do some public speaking engagements and stuff like that. My business is kind of this weird hybrid where most of the year it's like online business, but then for a certain window of the year, about 60 days, a little bit over that, before the event and then a little bit after, it's very physical, like brick and mortar. There's a lot of shit to do, a lot of logistics, a lot of people to hire, a lot of people to buy flights for. We're often buying like, you know, 15 to 25, even more flights, hotel logistics, you know, meeting people in person, renting gear. Like it's a huge, you know, six figure operation that is not like launching an ebook. So throughout the year, I feel like I'm in like online entrepreneur world, but then as the event closes in, it's very much like, let's get this shit going, like physically open the door. Well, I don't think people realize how hard it is to get dozens of highly successful men who have their own lives and their own schedules and their own plans to all get together in one place at one time uh, yeah. to do something. It is really tough. It's like, you know, it's like organizing an invasion pretty much. Yeah. 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 And the speakers too, you know, we're all uh, high testosterone, pure blooded alpha males and, you know, managing all these different personalities. There's some females too at the 22 but that's a pretty new phenomenon. Mostly it's just men, obviously. At our men's events, I only allow men to speak to men, for example. I don't allow women to give presentations to men. There can be a little exception here and there, like a Red Man Group panel or something. But anyway, managing all your personalities, like I'm my own bombastic abrasive personality. 
And even the most mature alpha men are also going to be, you know, have their own very strong wills that I have to kind of manage and mediate and negotiate and uh, just make everything work out. And yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult to be that. But working, you know, working with you guys makes it easy. A lot of you are, uh, all of you at basically at this point that stick around that are not the predators like the Jesse Lees, uh, pretty awesome to work with. And you guys make my life a lot easier and you help promote the events and set things up. So I appreciate it. Speaking about the predators, I think that's so important, the work you do to push those kind of people out and to make it clear what they really are, because most people aren't capable of seeing that. And very few get to see the behind the scenes that you get to see. And there's a huge difference between, and yeah. you've noticed this when you invite people, their public persona, you invite them and then you realize they're not what they're saying in public because you get yeah. a chance to spend time with them. But your average YouTube watcher, they don't get to see that. Yeah. And so they, they're, they're hearing this message from they're professional manipulators, essentially. And if you don't know what to look for and if you don't see them in person, you don't get to crack that exterior, but they can't keep it up, you know, 24 seven when yeah. they're in person. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I've actually thought about writing kind of a manosphere slash conference organizer slash YouTuber insider book someday just about all the fucking crazy shit that I've seen over the years. And it's not just, you know, when people see the memes or the hit videos, exposed videos, that's like the tip of the iceberg or kind of the end result. Le leading up to that, there's a big smorgasbord, a big buffet of bullshit where you learn something, a clue here, or someone asks you to like keep, you know, they tip you off about something and you're like, oh fuck, this is not good. Like another, you know, effing predator. So I think well, it's I've just- Good. I see you each time too. give these guys the chance to come forward and nobody's yeah. done it on their own. Like you, yeah. you're not just hanging them out to dry. You're saying, Hey, be honest, or I'm going to say what's happening. Yeah. I'm going to tell people what's really going on. Every time that I've seen you've given them a chance uh, to yeah. come forward. You've given them a reasonable amount of time and nobody's even made the smallest effort uh, to, to clear up the situation or even respond to it. Yeah. They're very, they tend to be, you know, this has been my experience with business and even outside of that in personal relationships. When you find someone, my, you know, Medusa story from many years ago, the wife thing, that was a, a personal example. But in business, it's very similar. People who are committed to living a lie, who are committed to living this fake facade and manipulating lots of people, social circles, family, friends, business relationships, entire online communities of hundreds of thousands of men and other and some women, too. I mean, it, it's sick and you realize how embedded they are with it and committed and their their teeth are, and claws are so deeply woven into it. They'll do nothing to get out of it. You're right. Like every every fucking case, it's like a, it's like an 80s action movie or like some Judge Dredd shit. I'm going to give you one chance to come clean. They never come clean. They're, yeah. they're, they're married to it in a way. They're married to the lie and they're married to the manipulation and they're married to the illusion that they have to make money. So they're financially invested in it too. And then emotionally, psychologically, all these kind of, I mean, you could probably speak to it better than I could, but I'm just kind of more. Well, this is why it's so effective. This is why their manipulation is so effective. And I talk yeah. about this in my book that all manipulation starts with your own internal manipulation. Mm -hmm. And the, the best liar convinces himself, at least while he's speaking the lie, that he's telling the truth. Yes. This way you can do it with this kind of authenticity yes. that um, a person who knows they're lying is very easy to spot. I mean, my your kid can tell you, you, you can tell a kid's lying when they lie because it, they're transparent. Yeah. When a professional liar, a professional manipulator lies, they first convince themselves it's almost impossible, even if that's your job. And I, I talk about becoming immune to manipulation, but I also talk about not having so much hubris to believe that you can spot every single manipulator a mile away. It takes some time sometimes yes. to see through this. And most people don't have the time to go and examine it. And we yeah. have all of these public figures going, washing through society and some of them wash out like jordan peterson um you know he self-destructed tailored self-destructed um but very sam harris of, sam harris i think is a recent one too yeah, he's in the middle of it right now yeah um and and that's great because that it's obvious but how many years did people follow these people yeah and maybe some of what they said is true but they mix in some manipulation and with it and it's yeah. so very rare to come across someone that actually has a chance to see them in uh, face to face and go, hey, he's not who he said he was. I better warn people. And uh, you get a lot of flack for warning people. Um, but like you're almost the only one doing that. Yeah. Thanks, man. I appreciate I mean, it. That's the only one. And that's important. And I know like, I, hey, I don't want to be there 
you know, punching celebrities and telling them to, you know, to smarten up. So what you're doing is really important for the manosphere itself. We have to uh, push out our manipulators because if yes. we don't, it's a contagion. It affects everything. I talk about manipulation creating low trust societies. Well, we are a sub community, a sub society within the manosphere. And would you say people, would you say manipulation is like a cancer? Like it just grows and grows. Yeah, absolutely. With feminism? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's it brings us it de causes us to deviate from reality. And eventually we deviate so far that we the, whatever organization gets saturated with it crashes and burns. We see, you know, American society's got so saturated with manipulation, it's crashing and burning. Um, the, the churches, people ask, think that it's because people aren't interested in God or religion. No, they're not interested in the church because they've seen how much manipulation is there. The church suicided itself. It didn't just die. It, it, it manipulated people when it didn't have to and created this situation where people don't trust it. And that's let's, why it's dying. That's why all our institutions are dying. Yeah, let's pause, let's pause on the church one because I've been thinking, I watched a couple movie trailers this morning. They're kind of comedic, poking fun at like, uh, and I think it was good, you know, the mega church pastors who are always like, you know, Joel Osteen and these mega frauds that are always like, you know, closet in the closet. Then they come out, you know, these sexual allegations, which are like true 80% of the time or 90 um, you know, stealing money, whatever. It's just, you know, I need, I need my fourth private jet, you know, cause Jesus told me I needed five jets and I got to get four and then we're going to get five. And I need a $10 million house because Jesus wants me to live in a $10 million house. Not you, but me. I mean, this shit is like some of that stuff you have to deal. We, we, so there's like, you got the Catholic pedo priest. Sometimes you got the predator pastors, Jesse Lee, you know, number one, building a cult out of it. So you got the Protestants, you got the Catholic stuff. I don't know about the Orthodox priests. I haven't investigated that yet. Then you got the mega church pastors. So there is, you're right. They suicided across denominations. They like blew up their own, their own thing. And it just got, I guess, because no one was willing to call it out. I know church militant called in the uh, Catholic church, they called it spineless, uh, feckless and spineless our bishops and stuff because they don't have the balls to call stuff out usually. Until it's like well, the last often, minute. They can't. they can't because the way that the church is structured is that you can't. Um, it's a kind of hierarchy where you can't call out anybody because it ends up affecting you. If they're yeah. downstream of you in the hierarchy and you call them out, why didn't you fix this problem before it got this bad? Yep. And if they're up above you, you can't call them out because they're your boss technically. And they can they, they can cause trouble for you, take you out of your position. And then you have no no room to speak. Yeah. Um, I know here in Portugal that uh, I know someone who was hired by the Catholic Church to go after these people that are that are predators and stuff in the church. And he's specifically they pick someone that is not a priest or part of the hierarchy because he's outside of it. And so he's not subjected to the same church law and he's able to be more effective. Uh, but it's there is a desire by many in the churches to purge them of manipulation, but they don't know how. And it's so yeah. deeply embedded in things. Where do you start? And part of the reason I wrote this book is to give people the tools to de to remove the manipulation from their organizations, whatever it is, if it's government, if it's uh, the church, if it's your family is to get the manipulation out so that you can restore the health. Let's uh, let's pause on this real quick. I should have entered the book sooner. So Noah Ravoy recently wrote and published Become Immune to Manipulation, How They Are Manipulating You and How to Resist It. It's a great book. Uh, I've skimmed it myself. I haven't read it yet, but I will be reading it. I'm excited to read it. Pretty thick, pretty meaty. It's a good design too. I like it. I care about the way books are designed. And when people pick shitty yeah. fonts and colors and the material, it annoys the crap out of me. I hate to when they matter. do the text all the way to the edges. I like white space. It's great yeah. for taking notes. You know, it give you a chance to, oh, I, I got to apply this. And really, that's the way the book is to be read. Uh, yeah. You read something through it. You see, oh, man, I'm going to go apply this right now in my life. Don't finish the book till you go apply that. Then come back, work on that next thing and work through it as think of it as a, a book with things for you to do, exercises for you to, to do to remove manipulation for your life from your life rather than some sort of a self-help book or for entertainment. Most yeah. self-help books fail because they don't really give you, they tell you what to do. They don't tell you how to do it. And so I focused on the how. How do you get manipulation out of your life? Yeah, we don't want it. How do you get it out? And it's, it's harder than we think is if we were to simply eliminate all the people in our life who manipulate us, there'd be nobody left. We'd be all alone. Hmm. And that's 
that is a manipulation in itself. The more alone you are, the less people you're networked with, the easier you are to push around and manipulate. And the, the better your network, the harder it is to push you around. So we have to ha walk this tight line between not allowing people to manipulate us, but not also burning every single relationship that we have. Yeah, I, I have to walk this line a lot. And I think about these issues a lot. I talk with them uh, with close friends too, like Tony Bruno and others. But, you know, walking this line in the Manosphere and with 21 Summit and the 21 Convention, and all these different relationships that I'm in the middle of, current, past, present, future, like, you know, in the works, basically. And it's very difficult to walk this line and to call out, you know, eventually frauds when they're when there's a problem or an issue becomes it becomes apparent that this person is a huge fraud and a fake and a hypocrite. Um, while also not burning a thousand bridges and looking like some, I mean, optics are important. I don't particularly care how people view me, but I'm also not, uh, I might be immune to social pressure, but I'm not invincible to consequences. So I have to pick my battles wisely, basically. And this is why when people see me fight with someone, you know, in some big battle, like the hypergamy wars of 2019, I call them with the fraud father himself, Rollery. People were like, you know, oh, Anthony's a bridge burner. Anthony attacked, did this. And this is all the opposite of reality. This is a manipulation by him uh, as a defensive position. Once he started attacking me and, and you know, uh, defaming me, he was actually the one who started it. And since then, yeah, whenever I call someone out, it's funny you mentioned that um, people get really annoyed. Like, oh, why didn't you see this sooner? Why didn't you call it out sooner? Oh, my God, this and that. And the reality is these people are not uh, sufficiently red-pilled enough yet to understand that at least 80% of the, the content creators they watch on YouTube and on Twitter and all this bullshit, these people are fake to different degrees. Not everyone is like a predator, you know, pastor or something like that. Uh, you have different degrees of hypocrisy and, and predation and fraud and people lying to themselves too. They, they eventually buy their own bullshit. I think Jesse Lee, man, he's been preying on dudes, young men for like 30 years. So that lie is so deep in his psychology I think in, you know, with Rollery too, like Rollo has built himself up in his, into this godfather, fraud father, and he actually buys his crap. And he's just like some never had, never was loser guitar guy who hasn't had a same at lay in 30 years. And his wife treats him like shit. And yeah. it's, it's, it's just embarrassing. This guy gives people dating advice to, it's, you know, embarrassing to watch. And then you have these young guys who are like so sucked into these little miniature cults of personality. Cuck Murphy was another one. Holy, holy crap. That was an epic explosion. That was awesome to watch. And I was very happy to take a big part in that behind the scenes. On the other hand, I've seen you have some pretty like serious arguments with honest men. And then I've seen you guys make up a day or two later and everyone yeah. is friends again and yeah. it doesn't end the friendship. And now that's the key is yeah. the honest men come back and go, yeah, I'm sorry. I made a mistake there. I was wrong. I said something that was incorrect and you guys restore the relationship. And I actually think that after that kind of a blow up, men have a stronger relationship than they had before they had a fight. Um, yeah. uh, arguments and fights make men's relationships with each other stronger yeah. because they, they test the reasonableness of both parties and they test whether or not they're really going to be honest. Is this guy really one of my guys or is he a fake? Yeah. And you know that you don't know that until you have a fight. This is part of the reason why some of the, um, some of the things that came up that you've exposed, you didn't realize it until you have a fight and the guy shows who he really is. Yeah, exactly. Until there's a test and a confrontation with uh, with reality and with yeah. their spoken word, what they profess to believe. I was thinking about this too, because I've been thinking about more exposed videos I need to do. There's actually, I always have a list of like 10 to 15 I need to make and eventually I get around to like one or two, you know, and then slowly over time. But I was thinking about doing some examples because in the past I've done examples in my exposed videos about politicians. And I focused on like a Democrat, Andrew Gillum, one time. The uh, He ran for governor in Florida. He, you know, alleged to be this, you know, strong family man and a good father and a good mayor. And then he was actually banging gay hookers in Miami and doing crystal meth and uh, other drugs and vomiting all over the place, all over the news. I mean, wow. it, it was it was a legendary, you know, F up for a politician after he lost, of course. And he presented himself to 20 million Floridians as a good man and a good father. And I love Florida and blah, blah, blah. But then I was thinking about Republicans too, like uh, John McCain, who died a couple of years ago. He professed for many years as the most aggressive uh, anti-Obamacare Republican. And then when it came to a vote, he was the one, the only one who fucked the whole thing up to repeal it. So it's like you have it on both sides of the alleged political spectrum. 
you have it in culture wars with uh, the Manosphere, for example, and other content creators. You know, there's all kinds of frauds on YouTube. YouTube has it. There's like the Manosphere, which is across different uh, platforms, you know, Reddit, you know, Twitter, YouTube. But then YouTube has its own content creator network of and who are mostly frauds. They just pretend to be you might. Maybe you can comment on this. I see a lot of YouTubers and it really annoys the crap out of me. They pretend to be like the friend of their viewers. Like, hey, fans, hey, you beautiful bastards, we're buddies today. It's like, man, you don't... Yeah, it's you don't, very fake. Yeah, it's super fake, but people fall for it because they're all, yeah. like, ob oblivious to manipulation. They need your effing book. And they talk to them like they're children. They yes. talk to them like they're children, which is the worst part of it all. And even my nine-year-old son, he'll come across some of those videos, and he's like, there's something wrong with this guy. And I, I, I take him, and I'll watch through some of these things, and I'll say, what's wrong with this guy? What bothers you about him? Okay, because we're told most children can recognize there's something wrong. And the problem is we're trained out of it. We're trained to ignore our instincts and to ignore yeah. that. I mean, most kids know that's a bad man. You get a little three-year-old kid, somebody wants to come up and give the kid a hug and the kid cries about it. Don't let that person hug your kid. You know, a kid might be having a bad day, but maybe the kid's got a better sense than you do of stranger uh, danger. Yes. You know, maybe that kid's right. Yeah. Well, kids have that instinct and we train it out of them. No, I'm sorry. You're not allowed to have your own personal space. No, you're not allowed to have your own opinions. Yeah. You got you to follow the dominant narrative. I say this all the time about especially young feminists, that most of them aren't actually feminists. They're just submissive women following the dominant narrative. And right now, the dominant narrative they hear is feminism. Yes. You're told this is what a good girl believes. Okay. That's what I, I think believe. it rises. I I get like 18, 20 year old girls uh, that I coach sometimes and I ask them, what do you want to do with your life? Well, my mom says I should go to college. Well, my teacher says I'd be a good engineer. I'm like, but what do you want? Well, I, th I was told that it's all I was told. Well, what do you yeah. want? Imagine if nobody told you anything and you just decided what you want. Nine out of 10 times they say, I just want to get married and have babies. Yep. And they say it so sheepishly. And I'm like, you, you feel that need inside of you. Yeah. Why yeah. don't you tell anyone? Tell people that's how you feel inside. Your needs matter too. And that's yeah. what manipulation is about, is saying your needs don't matter. You need to do what I want you to do. Yeah. And I want to... Go, go ahead. I just want to say, I want to add that, you know, you mentioned that feminism is a dominant narrative for young women. I think it's actually more than that. It's risen to the level of a kind of baseline religion for them because it dominates their belief system so totally and so absolutely and they have that, like you're saying, it's shoved down their throat from everybody, school teachers, their mom, their dad, their church pastor or whatever, their friends, their aunt, their grandma, maybe not their grandma, but pretty much everybody but their grandma and their grandpa. And even then, who knows, right? 50-50 on that, maybe. I mean, it's it's a disaster. And my girlfriend was like this too, man. Uh, she never went to college, thankfully, uh, which would be terrible. I think women should only go to college like 40 plus, if ever. But she wanted, you know, like to build a family. And these, these things are important to her, kind of family formation and all that. And everyone told her the opposite. That's stupid, blah, blah, blah. You need to go to college. You need to get educated. Thankfully, she never did. But otherwise, she wouldn't, you know, be here with me. But yeah, it's, yeah, a, it's a disaster. Don't, don't tell women what to do because we're telling them what to do. <laughs> so yeah. you can't. Yeah. Don't do it, man. You, and this is why I tell guys, like, you meet a, a feminist who's under 25 usually. And if you're, yeah. and if she hasn't ruined herself, like, you know, she's not ballooned up to 400 pounds and destroyed her health. Um, don't take too much stock in the fact she says she's a feminist. I'm like, mm. just be, become the dominant narrative in her life. And if she follows along with that, wife her, you know, if she follows along with you, that's great. And if she wants to, if she doesn't want to follow your narrative, then fine. That's, that's not who you're going to marry. And it's because otherwise, there's all the only other women you find who don't follow that narrative are the aggressive, uh, somewhat antisocial, high testosterone um, ladies that and, and, and uh, you know some of these are great women in some ways, but they're tough. They're they're difficult to deal with. But they have the backbone to say no to feminism. On the other hand, they also have the backbone to say no to all the betas. And there just isn't enough alphas to go around for these women. Yeah. Yeah, most men by far are betas. That's why men have to, we got to make men alpha again. They got to be fucking alpha. I've yeah. been thinking, uh, go ahead. I, I think the real difference in that, whether you're alpha or beta, is to a large extent, is did you grow up? Are you are you done growing up? 
Mm-hmm. And most men haven't grown up. We, you know, sometimes we talk about we live in a feminist society. That's not really true. There's nothing wrong with fe- femaleness. It's that we live in an immature society. We live in a childish society. And mm-hmm. so men are childish and they stay children. And that's, that's what a beta is. The beta is there to be told what to do. Like a, like a kid, what do I do? And he's looking to, to be told what to do. And when you grow up, you don't need to be told what to do. You become high agency, self-sufficient and capable yeah. of managing your own life. What is that? That's an alpha. Yeah. Yeah. You lead your own life. You're the author of your own life. You make your own decisions. You're constantly leading. You're constantly pushing in a certain direction. Even if you end up changing later, you're aggressive and assertive. Yeah. People get so butthurt about the alpha thing. They go, oh, you know, the, the, the scientist who made it up about the wolves, he, the way he doesn't even like it. There's the theory anymore. There's no alpha wolves. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't give a shit. It's a useful, it's a useful binary system to push guys in a masculine, healthy, mature direction and to make fun of beta males and shame them for being beta males, for being ignorant and not knowing better. I mean, to some degree, right? It's not infinite. I'm going to make fun of them enough to roast them and to kind of challenge them, to get them to feel, you know, something negative so that they do something, feel some pain, feel some emotional pain, you stupid beta, and become an alpha male. What do you think about guys who say that? Go ahead. So a woman told me yesterday, she says women see three types of men. There's alphas, that's who they want to reproduce with. Um, there are betas, that's who they want to get stuff from. And there are omegas, and that's who they want to crush and punish um, because it's, they want to make sure they're out of the gene pool completely. Like there's no way they're going to reproduce. Yeah. And the revulsion women have to that, that those, those men on the bottom, you know, and a lot of those men on the bottom, they could do a lot to come up. Very few of us are living up to our potential. Yeah. Most of us are, we've been manipulated into believing that the things we need to do to live up to our potential are somehow toxic. And so we're yeah. not doing that. And the, you, once you can identify that, like reading this book's a bit dangerous because once you figure out where you're being manipulated, you're going to see it everywhere. Mm-hmm. And the changes you're going to make are going to cause friction between you and the manipulators in your life. Yes. And it's going to change you for the better, but yeah, you're, you're going to have to nut up after reading the book. That that actually describes my own journey in the manosphere just as an event organizer, as a leader in a capacity that's always been central to like many different content creators and authors and speakers. And over the many years, I've become more mature, a lot more alpha and a lot less beta. And I've did this friction that people see over the past couple of years, three, four years, I've become much more aggressive and much more uh, conflict prone. Like, oh, there's a fight to be had with some fraud who's trying to manipulate me lie to their own fans, you know, other you know, cross fans as well. I just don't have any fucking tolerance for it anymore. So now when there's a fight to be had, and I think it's appropriate to fight and proper and healthy for the movement, then I fucking execute. And this like scares people, especially all the beta males, which is most of the manosphere. And it's even, it's most of the, most of the population. And first of all, but it's still that, that number 80%, whatever, it's still pretty prevalent in the manosphere and it sucks, but it has to get done. But anyway, it's been a personal journey for me to move in that direction where I'm willing and able to fight. And whereas when I was younger, I didn't have the power yet to fight. And I didn't understand how I was being manipulated personally, how these different speakers and coaches and whatever, how fake they really were. People I looked up to, whether or not they ever spoke. You know, for example, uh, I used to look up to like Neil Strauss, author of the game. And mm-hmm. it doesn't mean I don't like the game, the book that was uh, inspiring and entertaining. But Neil is a huge beta. He's always been kind of a little weasel. And Owen Cook is another one, Tyler from RSD. I used to look up to that guy. I used to love reading his blog. The guy's a huge liar, a huge fraud, and a huge beta. And when I was 17, 18, 19 years old, that was a guy who was kind of like a hero to me that I hoped would speak in my convention one day. I would never let him speak in my convention now. He's a loser. I can run circles around. I have more masculinity in my left fucking pinky than that guy does in his whole body. He's a liar, a fraud, and a fake, and it's disgusting. And there's a lot of men like that, that when I was younger, you know, in the, even in the manosphere, a young manosphereian, now I'm a lot older manosphereian, and now this, these people piss me off. And now I have a lot more power and a lot more reach to actually to fight with them and cause them problems that they deserve because they're lying, manipulative, fake pieces of shit, weasels and betas. And yeah, I think it, I think beta males too are very, they find this very peculiar, peculiar, I'm saying that right. It's like, they don't know how to comprehend it. It's like, who's manipulating me? How am I being manipulated? What the fuck's going on? Why are they fighting? Can't we all just get along and sing Kumbaya? It's like this fake unity to keep move the manosphere forward that actually holds it back. And then- yeah, Well, 
and one of the things too, like the alphas don't need to lie. Yeah. They don't need to show if they don't need to pretend to be someone they're not because they're completely happy with the person they are. But if you're a beta and you see these alphas and you want what they have, see, it's that if you're an alpha and you just are a beta, sorry. And you're just like, this is, this is where I am. I got to work hard. I had a client the other day. He's like, I guess I'm just, I'm not an alpha. Like I thought I was. And I'm like, you, you could be, but you're going to have to put some work in over the next few years to get your life in order. And he's like, okay, I accept where I am and I accept what I can be. I said, good. Now you're going to make progress. Yeah. The problem is they don't accept it. And their short, their shortcut to get there is to lie. Yep. And the alphas don't need to do that. That's, you know, you, you want to find out the best guys to get along with is usually the most dangerous men. The most dangerous men are the men that are easiest to get along with. Because they don't need to show off. They don't need to pretend to be something they're not. They just show who they are, and that's impressive enough. I told my, my son this. He's been exercising a lot. He goes back to school, and I said, don't go to school and show them how strong you are. Just let people observe. You don't need to show off. Just let it be seen by how you live. And most of these guys, most of these uh, betas, they didn't have a father. And if they did, he wasn't a man. And because of that, they weren't taught how to behave properly. They weren't taught that you have to earn being you know getting to the top and then there are some men who just never will yeah. and you know you got to you got to be comfortable with that you're going to keep struggling that's just what's going to happen and that that dishonesty that's at the root cause of all of these problems yes now that brings me to an important question i have so one theory i've had as i continue this war on the frauds and for to make the manosphere great again as i think uh it's more inadvertent. Like, I don't think it's because you're saying, and I, I agree that, you know, when there's manipulation going on, it begins with the self. It begins inside you. You're lying to yourself in some capacity to cover up some pain or some trauma or, you know, to avoid some difficult uh, inner work to become alpha, to become more mature, to become more masculine. So one theory I've had, though, is that one of the reasons that frauds become popular in the first place is because they lie so much. And therefore, in a in a like attracts like uh, kind of capacity, there's always a debate, right? Does it, you know, the like attract like or do, do people, the opposites attract whatever? I think there's probably elements of both of that at play throughout the world in our population, in our species. But anyway, with frauds, when these dudes lie so much, it actually attracts beta males who are lying to themselves. Oh, I don't need to be alpha. There's no such thing as alpha. It's okay to be beta Oh, whatever. Women are just hoes, blah, 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 like all this dumb shit. Anyway, so when I look at stuff like this, you know, Simpson and Hood, these guys are three, you know, key frauds, in my view, shardy, fakey, and fraudy. But they, now one of them is not very popular at all. I don't give a shit about the shardy lately. I destroy that guy. But these other two are still pretty popular for now before they blow up and implode. I'm looking forward to it. But anyway, it's like dudes who lie to themselves. The guys, the fans they have are mostly just beta losers by far, by far and large. They have some haters that follow them, but mostly it's this weak, beta males who grew up without a father they're raised by a single mom they lie to themselves they make excuses and i think these dudes attract them because they're just reflecting that at a higher frequency or a higher mm -hmm. volume almost so does that theory does that theory make sense and does that hold any weight to you yeah that makes a lot of sense a lot of these betas they have these walter Mitty fantasies i don't know if you know what i mean it's the it's a story where the guy he was in the army but he's like a desk clerk or something <laughs> He gets out and he tells people these stories of his great heroism and his entire life ends up being revolving around his imagination of who he could have been, if only. And yeah. these these frauds, they feed that Walter Mitty fantasy. Yes. And the thing is, is fantasies separate you from reality and they separate you from other people. And so the more that you can separate your prey from the herd, the more control you have over them. And you know, people are like, well, are they making a lot of money or this or that off of these? It's not about that. It's about the power they have to control other people, the attention they get from other people. Um, there are men that are just like women get a high off of attention. Yeah. You get a high off of people paying attention to them and looking up to them and saying, you're great. That's uh, exactly you know, what happens with these guys. Yeah. People people donate a five, you know, $5 super chat, right? Oh, shout out to the super chat, blah, blah, blah. And on one, on one hand, it's like, okay, thanks for supporting my show. On the other hand, it's that attention that they're giving them. And that's what these yeah. guys are addicted to, just like women. They're, they're all, these beta males are very female, like they're very effeminate in that way, that they love the attention from, especially from this kind of father figure that they have. It's really sick and perverse. Well, you know, Alpha, he, if he wants 
um, approval. He wants it from a peer. He yeah. wants another alpha to, you know, do the chin up nod that he recognizes him. And he doesn't need that, but it's, it's great, great to have that approval from another alpha. But these yeah. guys, they need it because their entire, their existence is based on a lie. And it's based on the fact that other people believe the lie. Because yes. if nobody believes a lie anymore, and we, we see this with other movements as well, uh, where if you don't believe their lies and their delusions, they say that they're, you're doing violence against them. You're erasing them. Yeah. Why? Because if you don't agree with their delusion, then all we've got left is reality. And the reality is not kind to these people. The reality yeah. is historically beta men did not reproduce. Yeah. And yeah, they get weeded. They get sent off to war to die. You know, they, yeah. they fight the wars of rich old men. They get uh, weeded out of the gene pool. They get cucked, literally. They get cheated on. They get, you know, all kinds of just nasty shit. What is it? 80% of men throughout history didn't reproduce? Something like that, historically? Yes. I mean, that's that's Love a perfect that split, alpha, beta. People say alpha, beta doesn't exist. It's like, look at the fucking history books. Or look at look at the evolutionary record. Or the ancestral record, whatever you'd call yeah. it. Now, the good news yeah. is we're all descended from alphas. That's the yeah. good news. Yeah, good point. Okay, so that potential to mature and grow up into a man is there for almost everyone. I think some people just get the short end of the, you know, genetic lottery and that's not possible for them. But for most men it is. And I don't think we've ever we've never had less fathering, but we've also never had more um access to the information that men do need through other sources. Yeah. And you know, this is there is no institution anymore that's gonna raise you up. No one's coming to save you. Uh, as, as Andrew Tate says, no one's coming to save you. No one's coming to save us. We're going to have to save ourselves. And while we're at it, grab a few friends and pull them along with you. Yeah. And that, that is, it's never been in such an equal playing field. You know, people are upset about their lot in life. They've never had a greater chance in history to improve that lot in life. Yes. But it's the fact that they complain about it instead of doing something about it that keeps them in their beta position. Yep. Beta males for life, but they don't have to be. Yeah. Yeah. It, so you do reject the idea then that, you know, I, I like to say that basically anybody like you're saying can become can be alpha, can become a genuine alpha, can transform into that, can really deeply, you know, achieve real personal deep change, not the illusion of it, not pretend, not just a little bit, like actually make fundamental changes. But then what, like I think what you're saying is they just make excuses. They don't want to do the work. I tell guys in my newsletter all the time, it's like, look, I'm. You can come to the my convention. I think it's the best event in the world for men by a long shot. It's extremely powerful for you, but it's not really going to change you. You're going to change yourself. The event's going to help you do the work. You know, Noah Ravoy, you know, AJ Cortez, Socrates, Coach Greg, it doesn't matter. They're not going to change you. They can't. Like, you can't change them. You, When you're a coach, I, ha I paid you for coaching. You're one of, like, the two men in the history of the universe who I've ever paid for coaching. Just because I'm, like, a cheap fuck. But also, I'm really, really picky. I don't like paying people for money for coaching if I don't really trust them. You and Pat Stebman, the only guys ever pay for coaching. But anyway, yeah, I know that you can't change me. I'm not. I'm under no delusion of that. And that's what makes when I see these frauds in the manosphere, to, you know, promising guys all this BS and all this like secret red pill knowledge, where they make them feel powerful. This illusion of power. They still don't know jack shit about women. Uh, it, it makes them. It makes them feel like they're changing, but they're really not. And they, they're still like oblivious to the fact that they have to change themselves. I'm sure in your coaching, this is what you believe, right? Yeah, they're, they're all about avoid uh, risk. So avoid, tr you know, avoid women basically because it's a risk instead of become the man that can handle risk. And I, I'm all about, yeah. Yeah, this sounds so lefty retarded, but I'm about giving men power um, mm. or showing them the path to power, you know, empowering. Mm. I hate to use that word, but. That's really what it is. The left has co-opted all the cool words, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Yeah. But that is what is necessary, developing your own agency so that you have the power to do it on your own. And I come from it, come at it from a fatherly frame. I don't want my son to need me to tell him what to do any more than absolutely necessary. I want him to know what to do. I want him to be impelled by his own inner person to do the right thing so that I don't have to do it. My goal is not to raise a boy, it's to raise a man. And my goal when I'm coaching men is to turn him in, is is to give him the path to become a better man, so that he doesn't need me. You know, as, as yeah. soon as possible, I want to get him to that point where you know he's a near peer, like he's he's coming up in my direction. And I tell guys, you know, there's going to come a point where, and this happens with almost every client, they go, "I was gonna I was gonna message you and ask you a question, but I thought, what would Noah say? Which means that I've implanted." 
the thinking process is necessary for having agency in their brain. And they go, I don't need to ask you the question because I already knew the answer because you've taught me the process of solving the problem. And that's really what it is, is like men are problem solving machines. There's no food. What do I do? I go and I hunt. Mm-hmm. I'll kill something and eat it. You know, uh, some the, the neighboring tribe is attacking our tribe. What do I do? I organize the guys and we build spears and we go out and we spear them to death. You know, we we solve problems, whatever the problems are. And the man who can solve more problems, that's the man who is more powerful. That's what yeah. gives you power is your ability to solve problems. Uh, th- there's um, when God appeared before Moses in the burning bush, he says, I am who I am. In other words, I become whatever I need to become to solve the problem. That's yeah. the epitome of masculinity is becoming whatever you need to be to solve the problem. And that requires a lot of agency, but it's mm-hmm. painful to learn that. Yes. Because you, you have to, you have to go around other men because you can, you're not going to learn this in a vacuum. You have to be around other men. This is why 21 convention is so important for a lot of guys. That's their first chance to be around other mature men. Yeah. They've, they've never of. maybe had that opportunity and those men will judge you. And that's the painful part. The painful part yeah. is that men pointing out your flaws, but you know what? If no one, if none of the men that are around you are pointing out your flaws, it's either because they're too stupid to notice them or they don't love you enough to tell you when you need to improve. And that's all you have to, as soon as you get over that shame of, and the shame comes from being manipulated all your life. The shame comes from mostly, and honestly starts with mothers a lot of times, the shame from your mother judging you for your failures gets generalized into the future. And if you don't have a father to correct that in your, the second half of your childhood, you keep it. And now your failures make you ashamed instead of the other man's judgment being seen as, hey, he cares enough about me to tell me I'm a fat fuck and I need to exercise. Like, so on know. the, on the judgmental part, I love that because you're one of the few men I've heard say that. And I love, I've tweeted it many times. I believe it philosophically from a, uh, objectivist point of view, judging is a good thing. You know, I think you should judge everyone and everything all the time, every day, 24 seven, if you're not sleeping. And this annoys people because they're always, you know, the left and the whole feminist crap and all the woke crap's always like, don't judge, don't be judgy. Why are you judging me? Oh my God. I hate this garbage. Your mind, it, like you're saying, it's a sign of insecurity. It's a yeah. sign of enormous insecurity. It's a sign of weakness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's just like extremely fucking lame to put it nicely. But yeah, it's good to judge. I mean, everything in objectivism, anyway. You know, everything your mind does, problem solving. You know, thinking things through, creating new ideas, whatever. You are judging right from wrong. You're judging judging reality. You are judging facts from fiction. This is why. This is what I mean by judgment. Judge, think, apply, do something. Now, you also mentioned um, basically like, fr- you know, being judgmental to your friends, telling them what you really think when they need to hear it. And that's what I did with my friend, John Thomas, who got big butt hurt when I made fun of him for getting legally cucked with a, what he described to me uh, from, from his, I talked to him privately as well. He described this chick as a, you know, like most Western women when he met her, of course. And now she has his balls in a vice like this and he has a little poodle. And he got really butthurt about this. You know, he threatened to, you know, basically threatened aggravated assault, all kinds of stuff. He got big butthurt on audio. I put it out. That pissed him off even more, which is pretty awesome. But anyway, someone asked about this guy and it made me think of this, like what you're saying. This is someone who I told him privately. I was like, look, I'm the one guy right now who has the balls to tell you what my honest opinions about and observations of what I'm seeing. And I think it's ridiculous and very unhealthy and very blue pill in a classic manosphere sense. You know, no buts about it. Like this is totally stupid A to Z. And no one else, I guess, around him. Everyone in public was like clapping and shit. I'm like, this you're like a bunch of seals. You're a bunch of zombies. In private, obviously, nobody's pulled him aside and said, hey, is this a good idea? This actually looks like a terrible idea. But nobody had the balls to say that. And of course, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to tell them exactly what I fucking think. And then I tweet about it. <laughs> because, because you know what? The truth matters above all. And no one is above the truth. When I was a teenager, we had a friend. Uh, the, my friend group is a bit older than me. And he was going to get married to this woman that none of us liked. And we knew it was going to be living nightmare for him. Uh, we yeah. kidnapped him. We took him to the woods for four days and made him go camping with us. Uh, and I mean, literally, we went into his house and grabbed him and dragged him out and threw him in the car and held him oh, down shit. until we got on the highway so he couldn't jump out of the car. And oh, we took him camping for four days. And, you know, we got him drunk and told him, like, you, you got to think about this while you're drunk, where your inhibitions are down so that you're thinking or sometimes inhibition lowering makes you think clearly. 
yeah. because we've been trained with these stupid inhibitions to, to ignore our own instincts for survival, yes. Yes. And especially as men. And we've been trained by that almost exclusively by women, by our mothers, because we have to put up when you're, when you're six years old, you got to put up with whatever your mom dishes out. So yeah. you just learn to take it and that, you know, I can't imagine she doesn't love me because if I do, that's the end of my life. And so you learn to put up with this and it becomes part of who you are. And if you, your dad doesn't get that out of you as you get older, um, it, it never gets out of you usually. So we, we made sure that he understood like we didn't like her and this is why. And by the end of it, yeah, they never got, they didn't end up getting married. He was kind of pissed off until about day three. I don't know how long we were going to keep him there. <laughs> yeah. Until he changed no. his mind basically. That makes me think about, I've declined several wedding invitations over the past couple of years because I don't support the wedding. I don't support yeah. the relationship. Right. And this, in, in my own you know private personal life, friends and family and stuff, this really pisses people off because they just, because it's so, you know, I guess, I'm, I'm sure a long time ago, this was more common. If you didn't support the marriage, you didn't fucking go or you went and you spoke up. This is yeah, how can you stand before. there and the guy says, does anyone have an objection and you not object? No one says shit. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, basically I would go do that otherwise, but it's you know, going to cause an uproar and these people are going to get super pissed. I might do it at some point just to fucking go that route. You got options, yeah. but I tell them flat out, like, I don't support the marriage. I don't support the relationship. It's going to blow up in your face. It's going to last probably three to seven years and then it's going to blow up in your face. Someone's in a divorce. Someone's going to cheat and it's stupid. It doesn't work. It doesn't work now. It didn't work before. It's not going to work in the future. Getting married is going to be, is like pouring gasoline on a, on a, a burning fire, a, a young fire at this point, right? So anyway, just it pisses people off super bad. But I wish more people. I hope that I can inspire men listening. Like if you see someone in your personal life, like Noah, you had a friend, you took him out to the woods, you guys got drunk for a couple of days, and you, you straighten him out. That needs to happen a lot more. That's what men should do for each other, and that's what I try to do. You know, John Simons was and maybe still is in a way a friend, right? Loosely speaking, we were never like close or anything. But he was a speaker a couple of times, and then he made this like really stupid blue pill mistake, and he's extremely beta. So I made him into a poodle, and then he got really butt hurt. But maybe he'll wise up and get out of this, you know, unhealthy, toxic relationship. That's probably kind of abusive, at least emotionally. But well, hey, maybe he I'm wrong. He doesn't get out of it. Just the knowledge of what it is. The only way he can fix it is to admit what it is. You yes. can't fix something that you're not admitting isn't working. And mm -hmm. yeah, I like John too. Um, you know, and I, I wish him the best. But man, yeah. like every man that saw the photos cringed, including yeah. his friends. They just yeah. didn't say anything. Yeah, That's exactly. The thing. It's not like nobody noticed it but you and me and, and yeah. a few other guys. Everyone yeah. noticed it. He just didn't say anything because yeah. we're all of the left and three quarters of the right are, are the no judgment people. They're betas. They're all fucking betas. Yeah. Yep. It's so, so rare you find a man that's willing to make judgments. And, yeah. you know, there are, there are the odd woman that's like that too, that's willing to come out and say things. And yeah. we have to, you know, I've noticed I have to be careful then not to jump all over those women and, you know, stop being a bitch type thing, you know, because, Actually, no, they're right, and they got to yeah. say something. Yeah. I would I say a, uh, Jan Professor Janice Famengo is a really good example of that. He always yeah. does it uh, even-handed and right. Very intelligent yeah. woman. She's a great yeah. man, in a way, Janice Famengo. Yeah. Yeah. Alpha, alpha woman, alpha female. Yeah, well, and, 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 and good at mixing that with, um, with feminine behavior, which is, <laughs> that is the, that's the hard thing is for a woman to mix that masculine agency with yeah. feminine behavior. And the yes. women that do that, those are the those are the women that men most are interested in. Like if you know if there are women watching this and you want to know what men are interested in, we want high agency women that still act like women. Yeah. And that's that's a really rare mix because th this yeah. idea that women are children, it comes from experience with women, mm -hmm. but it is a pain in the ass to manage a woman that's acting like a child. It's yeah. kind of funny at first. Um, then you try to have kids with someone like that and you go off to work and you're like, I wonder what's going to happen when I'm gone. Like, you shouldn't <laughs> have to worry about that. Yeah. Is the house so, going to burn down? Who the fuck knows? Yeah. What is she going to feed them? Like real food or slop, yeah. you know, genetically modified soy garbage. And, yeah. you know, you're, you're raising your kids. Mostly she does the work during the first, you know, seven, eight, ten years of their life. And after that, the father really does the, the majority should be doing the majority of the parenting after that. You got to have a lot of trust in her and she's got to have her act together. And, you know, a lot, I don't have a problem with a young woman not having her act together yet. Uh, as long as she has a the humility then to learn. Yeah. Uh, someone asked me the other day uh, if I'd write a book 
there, there's a book, The Care and Feeding of Husbands. It's for how women can take care of their husband, like what they need to do to support him. And they said, what would you write for husbands for women? And I said, it'd be the training and domestication of wives. And uh, that's basically what it is. As men, so often we end up with the only women that are available aren't completely developed yet. Well, isn't, we that, hang on, isn't this what husband husbanding means? Husbandry is yes. to, it comes from like domestication of animals, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, you get to exactly. domesticate the wife. You got to tame her and control her. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, 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 and the, uh, the objective is to get her to cooperate, not just to submit, but to cooperate. In other words, she can now operate on her own while you're gone and look after the, the you know, cover, cover all the things that you can't do because you're at work. You're out doing things. Um, I knew since a very young age that the path I would walk in life would be dangerous, that I would say things that people didn't like to hear. Uh, I was doing that as a kid that I would, you know, I have, I have been uh, investigated by the FBI for things I've said that were, wow. yeah, I've, I've had uh, child protective services uh, twice do investigations. I recently had an intelligence agency uh, claim that I'm a terrorist and, and a Russian agent and all kinds of stuff like this. Because wow. the things I'm saying are pissing the right people off and yeah. they're throwing whatever they can at me. And yeah. I'm being very careful that I haven't been canceled yet, but uh, I, wa I was on Facebook, but I haven't been canceled from all social media. Yeah. But what happens is, is I knew when I got married, I had to pick a woman that if I was in jail or on the run or there was some kind of problem, she's going to hold the fort down while I'm gone. Yeah. If you want to, in, in this day and age, if you want to be a man and you want to do great things, you got to pick a woman that has her act together or who will learn to get her act together after you marry her. And yeah. that's really like, you gotta, you gotta look for that while you're picking the woman. Well, you mean respond positively to your leadership is really yes. what that means. Like be responsive. Like yeah. Leah, and, have and to... Learn to imitate your agency. Like she needs to learn yeah. to imitate your agency. She sees how you make decisions and what she should be asking herself is my husband's not here, but if he was, what would he tell me? Yeah. Good question. And that's that's the ideal. And the closer she can get to being accurate in that, the better a wife she's going to be and the more happy she's going to be as well. What do you think about this meme? Uh, well, it's actually an advertisement, but it's also, I love it. It's hilarious. It's my favorite meme of the year. Dominate your wife, dominate life. And I just put but a picture of Elliot and his wife here uh, for it. Women with no funny. men will get offended. Women with a man that, that, that is a dominant man find this incredibly attractive you know there's there's this di there's this split so I, I show this this photo and I occasionally joke that i kidnapped my wife and that's how i got her to marry me and there's always a bunch of women that say that's so hot uh, mm -hmm. i love that you know you you dominate her overpowered her took her back to your tribe and married her and it's a it's completely a joke but they they women mostly if they're honest with themselves that's what they want yeah. they don't want to marry a man they can dominate now, yeah. there is a few exceptions to that. There are extremely broken women that cannot let go and cannot go into their feminine and are so far onto the masculine side of the, the um, uh, sexual dimorphism that they don't want, it's not that they want a man they can dominate. It's that they want a man child that they can mother. Yeah. They want a son. And, That's what they, oh, yeah, they want to turn him into kind of a son. Yeah. Yeah. It's very and, healthy and, and very shitty. Yeah. I, 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 I remember this feminist telling me, that growing up, my dad was my best friend. He was like an older brother to me and blah, 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 blah. Because I said, you know, feminists often have weak fathers. And her yes. answer was to reply like this. And I'm like, I wasn't sure if she was agreeing with me because that was pretty much agreement or disagreeing with me because she was proving my point. Yeah. Women want a man that they can't beat on any sphere. There should be yes. no sphere in which your wife can beat you. That's ideal. Yes. Now, sometimes because life is what it is, maybe your wife can earn more money than you. You know, maybe she's higher IQ than you. Okay. But you got to dominate her in all the other aspects. When you can't, she becomes anxious. She becomes fearful. If he can't dominate me, a woman, how's he going to protect me when the yep. bad man comes? Yep. And, and because oh, there's, there's no bad man, it's, it's the 21st century. It's like, have you been watching the news? You know, yeah. every every other thing is like civil war is coming. Uh, we're not going to have any food this winter, and uh, no electricity in northern Europe. And World War Three is coming. On top of that, yeah, and World War the, next, and the Russians and are invading, and maybe Ebola will break out next, like worldwide. Yeah. I mean, it's it's yeah. been it's been a wild couple of years, and it looks like it's going to keep heating up. Yeah, but, and I, yeah. I actually I, I've been kind of 
you know, wishing, hope, and praying that we get some massive, mass scale discomfort without a lot of people dying. Yeah. And I think we're going to get that this winter here in Europe. Uh, yeah. I, I made this joke on Twitter that uh, start, it was starting yesterday. Germans are now having to take cold showers. <laughs> the law passed that they're supposed to take cold showers to save energy. Well, it's going to get a lot colder pretty soon, right? I mean, it's not freezing yet, but it's going to get balls cold in, what, a month or two? The last time the Germans were forced to take cold showers and not have enough food to eat in the in the 20s, we got yeah. the 30s. Yeah. You know, are, are, we, are we trying for a repeat here? But, you know, if you want people, if you want men to wake up, give them cold showers. You know, yeah. um, think, think what this is going to do to women's psyche when it's like we can't even keep the hot water hot. Yeah. Because Russia cut the pipeline off, right? Permanently. And yeah. Indefinitely was the word. Yeah. And then they sent this picture to mock them of uh, a transformer with a couple of drops of oil on it and said, oh, there's an oil leak. We had to shut it off for safety reasons. Wow. Yeah. Apparently How, they, they, have, they have contracts. This is all contractual. And yeah. uh, their contract says it might have to be shut down for safety reasons. So they had to create a, <laughs> a manufacturer. <laughs> Where does but you live in? You live in Portugal. Where does Portugal get its energy from? Uh, we we get our Portugal and Spain are on a separate grid from the rest of Europe. Um, ah. the, the Spanish have almost all renewable energy that they destroyed their entire economy to build. Um, oh. Although at least, at least they got something this winter. And where I am, I usually never turn my heat on. I can I can walk around like this in the winter time most of the time, and I'm fine. Uh, wow. I, I could probably you know just wear shorts all year long, and I'd be fine. Not because it's warm, just because I'm a warm guy. Well, you're, it's, yeah, you're pure blooded out now. Yeah, I just take the beer, tuck it in my shirt, and I'm warm. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> but yeah, it's yeah, and my wife's like that too. Like my wife and I in a room, and the room's plenty warm just from the heat coming off us. So that's not a problem here. But the food shortages will be a problem everywhere because yeah. you know if it get people get hungry enough, they'll do anything to get food. Yeah, hunger is the best predictor. Of um, uh, of people becoming more conservative, yeah. Revolution I don't know if people realize right? that. Yeah. yeah, suffering through periods of of famine me, uh, ch permanently changes people's outlook on everything from immigration to government spending um, to government in their lives. It mm. changes everything, and we're about to get some hunger. It's yeah. going to bring us back in line with reality again. Uh, perhaps for the first time since the end of the Second World War. Everything's been good. good. We've been, every year, everything's better. It's going to keep getting better no matter. How, let's shit test the system and elect all women into power. You yeah. know, um, the Americans will bail us out again if we're in trouble. Don't worry. And now, you know, Europe is sitting here looking at America's trans army and going, they can't bail us out from anything. You yeah. know, they, they, they're going to have a hard time patrolling their own coast at this rate. Yeah. And... I mean, the U.S. government has clearly said, uh, if you look, there are documents from the U.S. government that have been made public that say the U.S. government is incapable of withstanding a civil war. Yeah. They I'm know it. So how, how can they protect Europe? So Europe's now on our, on our own, and we're going, oh, I guess it was a bad idea to you know, send every soldier home, get rid of all our guns, and put women in charge of the military. Yeah. I get, it reminds me, too, of uh, you know, you know, Führer, Führer Biden talking about like F-15s and a civil war and all this crap. And it's like, you're, you're clearly delusional. You clearly don't know a lot about this. You could know in your position, but you really don't. And yeah, America has an, an insane amount of guns. We have more guns than people in this country. Thankfully. I love it. Ammunition, well, you know, in the billions, who knows? Well, and what he doesn't, what, what I think a lot of politicians don't, they may realize this and that may be why they're so desperate right now is that very often a large number of the people protecting them, wouldn't side with them if they started to use weapons against the American people. Yeah. That's what, I, that's that's what I want to say. So it's, it's, it's anxiety that we're hearing. That's why F-15s, F-15s, yeah. like, what are you talking about? Does, does the Air Force even use F-15s anymore? They use, like, F-18s and shit. Like, what are you yeah. talking, talking about? Uh, they sold the last F-15 to, to uh, um, like, I think they gave it to Iraq in a military deal, like, years ago. Yeah. That's old technology, like, 1980s. Yeah, um, it was original Top Gun planes, not now. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's boomer okay, talk. F twenty twos now. <laughs> it's it's boomer anxiety talk because he's anxious about a civil yeah. war, and I guess when you poke and prod people and try to label half the country domestic terrorists, that you're kind of fucking asking for it. It's insane the stuff I've been seeing with that. Yeah, but 
Well, see, well if you look back to Lincoln, he was constantly talking about saving the republic. Okay, not not that what he did was the ideal way to save it, but he kept talking about saving the republic. And and if you look back at previous presidents, they keep referring to the republic. Biden never refers to the republic. It's all our democracy, our democracy, our democracy. Yeah. The U.S. is not a democracy. It yeah. is a republic. So what is he referring to that he's worried is, is not going to be saved? It's not yeah. the U.S. government. He's not worried about that. He's worried about their scam, their manipulation. Being I think he's worried about he's worried about the, the I think he's worried about the deep state is like really yeah. specifically what he's referring to. Democracy means deep state. They yeah. all these agencies, deep state, you know, all this fucking crap garbage. It all needs to be thrown out and purged, abolished, evil. Okay, the it. Supreme Court has actually started to restore some of this. Uh, I don't think that any gun laws will survive 2023. Um, they, they're going hard after it. And what a lot of people don't realize is that they, they didn't go after gun laws. They said that uh, laws that were, um, uh, that were, how did that go? Uh, that did not follow the Anglo-Saxon legal norms. So we're going back to pre-United States. Uh, were not constitutional because they that was what the Constitution was based on. Yeah. And so they, you have to prove now that a law follows those norms. Well, you know what else doesn't follow those norms? Um, Government-backed uh, education. So the school system is technically yeah. unconstitutional. Uh, income tax is technically, even though it's been a constitutional amendment, that amendment was done it, it didn't follow the rules that were necessary to put an amendment in because you can't change the amendment can't go against the previous existing law yeah it can add and, and amendments are not there to take away rights they're only there to add rights so we're gonna we're possibly going to see uh, massive changes and this is creating like we talk about civil war as being something with you know guns and shooting uh, there is other kinds of civil war there are manipula I, I say that manipulation is social and emotional warfare and we're in a civil war that is fought through manipulation yeah and it's people call that a cold war or or whatnot but it's a cold war fought through manipulation and this is why most people who are unarmed are, are unable to defend themselves in this manipulation I, a lot of people have been criticizing for example andrew tate over the things that he's been saying or more or less they just don't like him that's what they're criticizing him on yeah. And what I say to them is then provide a better alternative. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not out there influencing young men, you don't get a say in the future. You yeah. can't say, I don't like the influence that guy has. Go take his influence then. Yeah. Take it from but him. They, but they can't because they're too fucking weak. Yes. Yeah. Well, because nobody's going to listen to them. And because they haven't actually been out there in the trenches with young men to know what young men are even interested in. Yeah. And there, yeah. and a lot of guys, their solution is, well, go to church. It's like, which church? Which church is going to help young guys make more money, get a woman, and 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 how and and get independence from this system? Yeah. Most of the churches are so embedded into the system, they're going to go the other way around. Yep. You know, I, I know young people that told me we go to a church, we sit down, a woman pastor comes out, we shake our heads, we get up, we leave, we go to another church, gay pride flag, we leave. And they're telling me this, like with pain in their voice. We're trying to yeah. find a church. We go through 15, 20 of them. Not a single one of them has anything to do with the Bible or God. And we're, how much more are we supposed to look? You yeah. know, and these are serious young people that are really making an effort. And so we have to offer young men alternatives. And I think there should be lots of all healthy alternatives um, for role models, what young men can do. And nobody's yeah. doing that hardly. And, you know, instead of complaining, complaining is what betas do. Alphas go and solve problems. I think only the manosphere is. That's, I've, been, I've been thinking about lately, and I think you'll get this, the rise of the manosphere. And it's increasing, it's escalating, significantly escalating prominence in mainstream culture. Yeah. You had in, you know, the, the 2010s, you had the Red Pill documentary. It was kind of a thing. In 2020, we had Make Women Great Again that I started and you were part of. Um, that hit, you know, huge 150 million people, New York Times, all that. Then we had Kevin Samuels blow up in 2021. You know, that was huge, million plus subscribers all over the news. Then he died, unfortunately. Yeah. Then you had now you have Andrew Tate, the rise of Andrew Tate, one of the, the the single one of the single biggest events in internet history that was just like recently, a few weeks ago. And that guy, you know, Tate, he's criticized the manosphere, rightly so. He gets along with me just fine, a lot of our speakers, but the manosphere has a lot of fakes and frauds. But ultimately, I think he is a manosphere, like hundred percent, in terms of his ideas and 
his relationship spanning many years at this point. It's a significant part of his life and and kind of where he came from on the internet. And now he's like the biggest dude in the world in terms of uh, popularity and search and you know trending kind of stuff like that, right? So it's like every year that goes by, the manosphere escalates more and more and more into mainstream culture. I think because the need for it is so dire, there's nothing else. There's no church. There's no this organization. There's no government. There's no school. All the universities, all the, almost all the churches, everything, every institution you have, every corporation, right? All Fortune 500 companies are woke as fuck. Everything is like fucking toxic garbage left and right, A to Z, up and down, inside and out. Except the manosphere is the one thing pushing back against that uh, wholesale, as I see it. Everything. The manosphere, you know, organically rejects the transformers, the feminism, the woke, all this garbage, all the lefty crap, uh, even all the fake rhinos and crap. I mean, it's a huge pushback against all of it. It's a push for authentic masculinity. And that also is why I think getting the frauds out, like we talked about earlier, is so important. As it gets closer and closer to mainstream, it has to, we have to get them out. It's a problem that I'm trying to solve as hard as, as, hard as I can, as fast as I can. It's difficult. And people don't get that. You know, they think it's just like some game and it, it is a game, but it's also very serious and it's hard. It's difficult to play this game and to win and to fight. Well, and if someone wants to help you move this forward, dump some money your way. You know, mm -hmm. this is expensive stuff. It takes time. It takes energy. You've done a lot of research background on things. You don't put stuff out unless you're absolutely damn sure it's true. Um, yeah. And that that takes effort. It takes time. And I know there are mature men out there that don't want to get their face involved in things. Um, but if you want to change society for the better, you're not going to get anywhere through politics. There's no point in, in you know supporting and donating to politics at the moment. This is where the power is. The power isn't in the government anymore. The government's a dying entity. The power is in the manosphere and other places like that where people okay. are organizing. And I think we're still in the prototype stage. Yes. You know, we're, we're just... Yeah. We're, we're getting to the point where we're ready to go mainstream and have a big effect. And I think starting the Patriarch Convention a few years ago was extremely important in that because you were, we're promoting patriarchy is the rule of fathers. It's not just the rule of men. It's rule of the men who have demonstrated success and demonstrated that they can, um, they can manage their own families. And throughout history, the patriarchal societies have always dominated the, the mixed or matriarchal societies because we do a better job of running society and put promoting that again. I mean, that was, that was the first positive mention of patriarchy in like 50 years was you studying yeah. that convention. Yeah. And now I'm hearing positive mentions about patriarchy everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It just occurred to me, you know, I mean, there was a whole series of what went up to led up to that event, but it was my decision ultimately to call the patriarch event. And when I did that, even in the manosphere, it was controversial. Like, oh, is that a good idea? <laughs> da, 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 da. I'm like, yeah, fathers should lead their families. Me, you know, men should lead in society. At minimum, that's, that's what this means. They should lead their families. They should lead their marriages. They should lead their relationships. You know, whatever. Lead their churches. Lead, 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 lead. And this is what patriarchy, what patriarchy is. And yeah, we, we got to steal these words back from the left and the feminists and crap. That's why I use it too. It pisses them off for free. Yeah. That's the best. You got to find like what's super effective and then free. You know, make women yeah. great again. Boom. You know, I got it from Trump, obviously, who got it from Reagan and whoever else said it, Clinton. But, you know, now it's we're going to make women great again. We're going to make men alpha again. We're going to bring back the patriarchy because they they blew it up. And we got to rebuild it. And they're just we're going like, to rebuild it bigger, stronger and better than it ever was before. And yeah. this time it'll be rebuilt in such a way it can't be torn down. That's right. Boom. There you go. Nail in the coffin. Boom. I love it. Yeah, we need it. Well, and the thing too is, is you never do things halfway. When you do something, you go like balls to the wall. And I think calling yeah. it the page, you got it. You got to, you're not going to win with the left by trying to meet them halfway. Yeah. We have to establish our goalposts and set our boundaries for what things are and then yep. force them to conform to us, not the other way around. And yes. I talk about that in the book that a big, uh, one of the keys to resisting manipulation is to know what your boundaries are to set them. And then you need to develop the power to enforce your boundaries. So if you have boundaries, but you have no power to enforce them, you might as well not have boundaries. You see this in the US, southern United States. If they're not willing to enforce the boundary, what's the point of having a, a border? Yeah. And it's the same with any personal boundary that we have with other people. We can have a person in our life who sometimes manipulates. Because like I said, if we got rid of every manipulator, we'd be alone. Yeah. We may have a family member that we love dearly, but they're a bit manipulative. 
my family who who's manipulative doesn't manipulate me and my wife's family's manipulative doesn't manipulate me i hear when they're talking they're thinking about what they're going to say <laughs> they're thinking i know it's not going to put up with bullshit yeah I, I i'm going to have to deal with him straight and this is what happens people start dealing straight with you now on the other hand you have to be rational and reasonable in return so you have to mm -hmm. give something back in return for that um but you you make sure that you just don't you can manipulate other people. You can't manipulate me. I won't tolerate that. And you can't manipulate my wife and you can't manipulate my kids because that's our job as men is to protect our wives and children. Yes. And that, that changes society because people now have to develop their skills of persuasion. And here's the thing is, is that most people don't have much of value to offer. And this is why they have to manipulate because they, they can't persuade. They can't say, um, okay, I'll do this for you and you do that for me and we'll be even. They can't do that because they don't have anything to offer. And so yeah. they're trying to create a false debt through manipulation that you then have to pay and give to them. Yeah. And once you force them to do persuasion, they have to up their game. They have to become better people so they have something to offer. So by resisting manipulation, you would make other people better people. The yeah. knock-on effects are massive. Um, you know, the, the trust that is increased in society. If I can, if a man allows me to manipulate him, I can't trust him because that means someone else could manipulate that man as well and turn him into my enemy. So I can't trust any man that I can manipulate. I can only trust men that are resistant to manipulation and will tell me off if I ever tried to do that to them. Yeah. This is, this is much bigger than just our own personal needs and interests. And we owe it to ourselves, but it's also a duty to society to resist manipulation and set that example and create those knock-on effects out into society. And if, you know, five, 10% of people in the world and in the West read this book and become immune to manipulation, that's enough to have an effect over the other 90, 95% because most people, they follow the dominant narrative. And that yeah. five to 10% of people now, when you can't be manipulated, you suddenly become dominant. Yeah. Now you are the dominant narrative. And, and in this case, the dominant narrative is truth. And the truthful narrative is a lot easier to maintain than the lie. Yeah. And when you're faking reality, you create, you're creating multiple realities in a way, mm -hmm. at least figuratively speaking, and you have to manage them then. So when you, you know, when you have, especially when a, a lie is like against involving multiple people, multiple conversations, this and that, you're creating like three or four different realities. Or as if you were honest and truthful and blunt, you have one to manage because there's only one reality. You live in existence. You live here. I love what you said too about feminism not meeting them halfway, like all these cuckservatives, all these fucking beta males. Yeah, like what I, with Make Women Great Again, one of the main elements of it, in fact, probably the biggest one of all is I want to abolish feminism. Zero feminism, fucking zero. Not a little bit, not halfway, not 20%, zero. And this scares people because they're like, wait, what? No, what blah, blah, blah. They just start, they, they freak out like a little talking head, you know, a little, uh, like a little plastic thing, like, you know, bobblehead. And well, no, conservatives are definitely conservatives are deathly afraid of winning that's yeah. the absolute worst thing that can happen to them they're afraid of winning and they're afraid of women and they're afraid of mm -hmm. you know womankind and their wives and their mothers and their daughters and all this bullshit you know one thing you mentioned earlier that i wanted to say that anytime you know since i really woke the fuck up got red pill became ultra uber giga chat alpha male anytime i hear a girl say that her father is or was her best friend you know, beta dad, beta dad, and the girl is probably skank or she's fucked up. This is yeah. the truth. 99 times out of 100. Your father cannot be your friend. You know, Pat Campbell, may he rest in peace, one of our speakers, he said this uh, a couple times at our convention on stage. And I love that. He was, he had like five kids, Catholic guy, right? You know, bring, bang, be fruitful, multiply. Anyway, he told he would say like, I'm not my kid's friend. I'm your father. And, you know, was wife and your husband, but you know, I'm your father to kids. He's like, I'm not your friend. And he said it very sternly, but very uh, kind of warmly too. You know, he was, I mean, he was a very intense guy, no matter what. I mean, look at the guy; he was a beast. But yeah, I loved I loved hearing that. It came to mind. Um, another thing you mentioned. Uh, oh yeah, so something I'll, I'll you know just let the audience know too, just kind of anonymously. But I had to deal with the speaker just recently, a couple of days ago, a uh, potential speaker for the event. Never spoke at our event. Big YouTuber, right? You know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of subscribers. One of the biggest speakers we'd ever have. And he tried to manipulate me, and I told him basically to eat shit and suck my balls, and uh, you're done. You know, you'd be lucky if you don't get memed to death. So, like, I'm gonna shove him down his throat and you shit him out his ass, basically, is what I told him. So, literally. So that was this one more recent example where I had, 
you know, someone tried to manipulate me, an instant, all right, you're done. The minute someone tries to fucking manipulate me in some underhanded covert way, especially when it involves business, speaking engagements, you know, any kind of major deal like that, you're fucking dead to me. Because I know that this person, you know, that you're going to try that shit with me, you're going to try it again. You're going to try it to my friends. You're going to fuck up my business. You're going to fuck up the manosphere. And now I know who you really are behind the mask, behind the bullshit, right? The authenticity and mission and purpose and all this bullshit. It's all fucking fake. But, I'm, but in a way, I'm thankful because it also exposed, you know, what was behind that mask, right? That I was still curious about. I didn't know. I was willing to have him speak. I didn't. I was like, hey, maybe this guy is legit. Maybe this guy is good. Meeting him will help me understand that, right? Face to face, shaking hands, eye contact. But no, nah, you tried to fuck with me like that. You're dead. Done. Permanent. No fucking going back. Then, of course, didn't even apologize. You know, double down. Like, ah, ultra scammer. You're going to burn. Well, here, here's the thing. At, at this point, um, they they should know who they're dealing with. Like, it's not like you're not, yeah. you're completely unknown. You yeah. know, and, and that's not, I mean, a lot of people are very successful at manipulating and they're not even yeah. very good at it. It's just yeah. that people are so susceptible to manipulation and people are such suckers that they get pulled into this. And it's, do you remember those anti-bullying campaigns where they take the bullies aside and they'd say to them, um, you know, you shouldn't do this to kids and you shouldn't do that to them. And then you shouldn't like waterboard them and these other things. And the bullies are sitting there taking notes and go, man, I never thought about that. Oh, that's a yeah. great idea. I'll do that too. Yeah. Cause most bullies, like they did intimidate you. Maybe they'd slap you around a bit. They didn't have, they didn't have a lot of, uh, imagination for it. Yeah. Well, this is why I didn't write a book to say you should stop manipulating. Yeah. I do say that in the book. Don't manipulate if you are, cause you'll just get it back. But I wrote a book so that the people who are getting manipulated can defend themselves. And that works the same with bullying. If you teach the kids that are getting bullied to hit back or do what I did when I was a kid and organize the other kids to overwhelm the bullies, even if they're bigger and older than us, beat them till they had to go to the hospital, um, <clears throat> then you don't have a bullying problem. You can't solve the manipulation problem by telling the manipulators not to manipulate. Yeah. It doesn't work. You just, you got to be. Immune I to think, it. Then you got to teach think, your kids and your wife to be immune to it. And it just spreads out from there. With the manipulators, I think what happens, and let me know what you think about this little mini theory, they develop a sort of arrogance organically from successful manipulation, even of like just dumb, naive fucking sheep. They just build this kind of false bravado for it in their own heads. Sorry, they might not even talk about it publicly, but they, they really believe their own bullshit. They believe their own capacity to manipulate. So then when they run into me or someone like me, like you or my other friends or other speakers and stuff, they just get fucking clobbered. They don't know what to do. But then also it's like, did you, did you not see me in public? Like you didn't just meet me. Were you not paying attention for the past several years of, of actually fighting with these people and actually succeeding and destroying some of these frauds and causing catastrophic, uh, you know, exposing, uh, basically exposing them with the truth and then catastrophic consequences for them, often financially. And these things are sometimes you can track. You can track, you know, the Patreon dipping 50, 60 percent in a year. You know, you used to have a thousand people. Now you have 400. Oh, that's too bad. Loser. All kinds of shit like that, because I hate these people. All frauds deserve to be exposed and deserve to be destroyed in some capacity. Right. Maybe not killed or anything. But no, if you're going to lie to people, then you deserve what's coming. You've, you reap what you sow. You lie to yeah. people, you manipulate, you you steal to people. You basically they're stealing from people through manipulation. It's not force. It's fraud. And and, and objectivism, philosophy, objectivist philosophy, it's really the two sides of the same coin. It's just force applied directly, physically, or indirectly through lies and manipulation and fraud. Both are wrong, both are evil. But one, of course, is more difficult to detect due to its nature of being indirect and, you know, uh, a lot less transparent, a lot less easy to see. It's easy to, when a bully is manipulating somebody with his fists, you know, like a kid, it's easy to see, it's easy to spot, and hopefully you can put a stop to it. But when you're being lied to, it's a lot more cognitive. It's a lot more mental, psychological, and philosophical, too. Yeah, um, a bully punches a kid in the face. He feels it in that moment. Yeah. Um, a manipulator gets you real good. That might bother you the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. I actually think manipulation is worse than getting punched in the face. I mean, getting punched in the face might do you some good. Might get might change the way that you behave, and so you go off and learn how to fight, and you know you become grow up because of it facing bullies. But if you're manipulated, very often it undermines you, it neuters men, uh, it it encourages women to behave in ways which are completely destructive to them. And yeah. even when the manipulator is long gone and dead, 
people still hear that voice in the back of the head of that person that was manipulating them. And they're yeah. still making bad decisions because of it. Yeah. It's truly evil in some cases. It's echoes of manipulation. It's echoes of trauma coming, uh, hitting you in the head. Yeah. So I want to talk more about the books um, more explicitly, though, some of the table of contents I'm looking at here. So you begin the opening of the book with, are you being manipulated? So my question is, how do you know you're being manipulated? What are some of the, can you give us some of the teasers from the book? Like, what are some of the basic, you know, three ways someone can detect that they're being manipulated by a fraud or a predator or a con artist or some nasty BPD Jezebel woman? So there's a bunch of techniques that manipulators use. Uh, shaming, guilting, we call it GSRM. There's, there's about a half, or there's about a dozen of them. And these techniques, they're designed, uh, they're designed to get you out of your rational mind and into your emotional social mind. So you're complying for social reasons rather than because it's the right thing to do. And anytime someone is trying to limit your rational thinking, they're almost certainly manipulating you. And they'll limit it by stimulating your emotions. So, you know, think of the children. You know, you get, you get rid of guns because you got to think of the children. What about the poor kids? You know, that's very clearly manipulation because they don't want you to make a rational decision. They want you to have an emotional feeling about children and protecting children. Well, it could be and some a, hot, a, trick trying to, hot trick trying to manipulate you as well, just blowing you, literally. Yeah. I mean, sexual yeah. stimulation and that kind of pleasure is a, is a very, they call it the pleasure prison. It's how women manipulate oh, men. Highly manipulate. Uh, the, the, a great example is strippers. Strippers are master manipulators of men. Mm -hmm. um, so... I, and and I, I know some some ex strippers. It doesn't mean they're all bad people because they're master manipulators of men. But that was their job. Their job was to get money out of men, and so they understand how to manipulate a man's loneliness, to manipulate a man's uh, hunger and desire for a woman. And they'll get a ton of money from a man without even touching him. Uh, that's gone on to OnlyFans now mostly. So they'll they'll get money out of guys without touching them. They know the things to say. They know the things to do to trigger that man's emotions so that it overwhelms his common sense. And anyone looking at it from the outside goes, what a moron. Like he probably thinks if he sees another guy doing it, he probably thinks the guy's a moron too. But when he does it, it's triggering him so much in the emotional sense that his logic shuts down. And the, the more trauma you've had in your life, the easier it is to shut your reason and logic down. Just, that's what trauma does. It floods you with cortisol so that your reason shuts down. And so that's, that's the first way. The other way is when you see someone trying to manufacture a debt that you don't owe them. Yeah. This is particularly useful against men. So men are highly reciprocal. We, we have this built-in honor code that if you bro does me a favor, I do him a favor back. Like I guy buys me dinner because um, we all go out together. Guy buys dinner and tomorrow I buy them dinner or you, got, you buy a beer, I buy you a beer back. We have this reciprocity and they will use manipulation to manufacture a false debt. So here's a great one. White guilt is a false debt manufactured to convince white people that they need to keep donating, keep giving money and keep um, giving up their political power, whatever it is, because somehow some original sin of being born with white skin uh, makes you guilty. So that's one, one example of it. And yeah. these, these debts, they can never be paid. There is no way you can square that debt. That's the other way. Look for, look for that manufactured debt. You know, as a man, if you owe somebody something, you don't need to be told. If you need to be told, you're not a man yet. Yeah. You, know, you know you owe somebody something. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to, to lend a new friend a small amount of money, like 100 bucks or something, and then not, never say anything about it again. Yep. And if he doesn't pay me back, I don't keep hanging around with him because he's, he's not a man yet. If he's not interested in paying back his debts, I shouldn't have to say anything about it. So men know when they have a real debt, you got to get out of your emotional self, go back to your logic and think, do I have a real debt here? Do I actually owe this person anything? Who are they to me? And so we can start to, to realize this isn't a real debt that we owe. This is a manufactured debt. Um, and the last way that we can see that, the, the third important way is that it is um, the end result is non-reciprocal. So they want to compel us to do something that's a win-lose situation, win for them, lose for us. And any kind of relationship that is consistently win-lose is a toxic relationship and needs to be ended. Yes. And so that's, that's the things we have to look for. A and woman, a woman. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, people will, you know, there, there are, there are people who are bad at that accounting and they don't recognize that they're in these win lose situations. I know guys in win lose marriages and they're, they're just losing, losing, losing. And their wife doesn't, re- they, neither of them are willing to recognize it. So it's not always easy that one for men to recognize, get some outside help, get some outside perspective. We should have men we can trust that go and make judgments. They're going to tell us, no, you're being stupid. That's wrong. That guy's manipulating you. We not only have to protect ourselves, it's really important. I I mentioned in the book that part of the defense against manipulation is to be ensconced in groups where you have people to have your back. Yeah. Because there are times when you don't see the attack coming, but someone else will see it. Someone else has got your back. Uh, Recently, there were some lies told about me. And I didn't notice them. Someone else found them and sent them to me and said, do you know this is going on? And so I was able to like kind of expose it. And the more you expose it, the funnier it is to people and the less they're likely to believe the lies. And so I was able to get that out there. I never saw it coming. I didn't see it on my own, but a friend had my back and he let me know it's coming. We need that. I think that for uh, young guys right now, if you're not in a male group, if you're not in a, a group that like in a life and death situation, they'd have your back. You need to create that. And if you have no idea how to create it, come to 21 convention, get into that group there, feel the camaraderie amongst the speakers, amongst the people that attend every year. And you're going to start to understand why it's so important to be in a men's group, to be in a group of men in a fraternity. And, you know, you don't have to have one near, near you. You can make one. Talk to guys when you're there. Ask men about that. How do I make more male friends? How do I create a group in my area? You know, if, if, if you can't come up to me, I'll talk to you about that. I'll explain how to do it. That's yeah. incredibly important to get having yourself protected against manipulation. Just to make sure, too, that the guys know. Uh, so you're not speaking at the 21 convention. Technically, you're speaking at 21 no. Summit. You're yeah. speaking at two of the three events. So the good news is, though, these are the speakers of the 21 convention. You know, blah, blah, blah. Great. I mean, to put it light, nicely or lightly. But they can also, when they attend 21 convention, they get a free, basically they get a free ticket to the Patriarch convention, which is where you'll be speaking at. Now let me put that uh, link up here real quick. So the Patriarch convention goes on at the same time, same weekend, and you basically get dual access, complimentary access to both events. And they can pick and choose to see uh, which event they want to go to, which speaker they want to go to. So they can go to like, you know, 80% of speeches at 21 convention with that ticket, but they can go see you and maybe Michael Foster or Elliot if they want depending on how they want to do it. It's kind of like your choose your own adventure uh, kind of deal. I make it like a theme park, basically the events. So there's Elliot with his lightning eyes. And then if we go down to here, that's where we have the speakers. Noah's there. Brian Save, Socrates, Jeff Younger, Coach Greg, Thanos, Foster, Elliot, Noah, Pat. A lot of amazing men. These are a lot of men I respect, man, all of you guys. I haven't met everyone yet. I'm looking forward to it all. Yeah, it's awesome, man. And then if you're a chick, you can go to 22 convention as well. If you're a female, a birthing person. A so what, are some, <laughs> yeah. what, are, um, what are some of the other defense defenses men can develop against manipulation? You mentioned developing a strong group that would have your back, life and death, you know, whatever. That's good. That's That's been true throughout all of history, I would think, too, by the way. So let's put that in a context. Like, that's not just true now. That's true always. And I think it always will be so long as we're, like, physical human beings. We're not robots or something, right? The singularity is coming. What are some of the other well, defense all, mechanisms men can develop? You also have to know who you are. Uh, most mm-hmm. men don't know who they are. Ask a man, who who are you? I'll say it's a married man. He goes, I'm a husband and I'm a father. Okay, that's who you are to your family. But who are you? Well, I'm a man. I'm like, well, yeah, I can tell that. You didn't really need to say. But who are you? And that's a tough question for a lot of men to ask. Uh, part yeah. of the reason is, is it requires some introspection that might be painful. Because it might include some things you don't like and you know things you want to work on. If you don't know who you are, then you're just sitting there waiting for some manipulator to come along and tell you who you are. And as soon as they can control your identity, then they can control what you do. And so you need to know who you are because who you are defines what you're then going to do in the world. You need to know what you actually believe in versus what you think you believe in. And so you know, I will see. Uh, I will see a lot of people claiming to believe in certain things and then you see them in private and their private life doesn't meet up with that. And they're completely unaware of that dissonance there. 
They're unaware yeah. of it. You know, men, I'm, I'm loyal to my wife. You're loyal to your wife because no other woman wants you. you know? Well, you're loyal to your wife because you're a slave, not because you choose to be loyal. There's yeah. no, it's not some code well, you have. Yeah, she's got your balls in a in her purse. You know, you're you're. Is that loyalty or does she own you when you're her slave? Yeah. So we need to actually. Know who I actually want to pull up a live uh, example right now. I think of what you're talking about, and this is this guy I love picking on because he's such a beta. I wish I wish the best for him in a way. Like if he stopped being a fraud and stop being a fake fraudulent loser. But anyway, this guy. So if we look old school years ago, this guy Conum and Sharp. He ran his own channel, his own kind of little brand before anyone really knew he was a fraud. And it was about him and the red pill and blah, blah, blah. But he's slowly been consumed by this Jezebel, uh, Devon Sharp, a single mom pushing 50. And she's basically, as one speaker put it to me that we know both, um, I'm not going to say his name, but he said she basically invaded his channel. And really, when he said that word invaded, I'm like, man, that hits the nail on the head. She invaded his mind and his identity. She told him now who he's going to be. So it used to be Conovan Sharp. Now it's Donovan and Devon. And how it's actually called How To Relationship has been the whole rebranding. So we went from red pill, you know, a fake alpha male to just completely cucked and co-owned. He's basically been invaded and enslaved by this uh, 47-year-old, you know, single mom. And it's just embarrassing to watch for a man for content creator. But a lot of what you're saying really reminds me of this because this is such a it's such a visible or vivid example of, you know, someone who didn't have an identity, who faked having a strong one and then was invaded and had his hindbrain kind of cucked and controlled a lot like, uh, you know, John Samas. Like that's another guy who got and if you actually look at his channel over time, it got invaded by a chick. It's not as explicit as with Conovan here. But with him, it's I mean, it's all about her, basically. It's actually become all from all about him. Then it kind of split in half. And now it's like 80% her, 20% him. As she continues to dominate the relationship, he even jokes about her blue balling him and all this kind of stuff. It's very, it's a very sick, perverse kind of relationship. I, yeah. I remember, it seems like two years ago, where the only picture I saw of her on there was her ass. Uh, he had one shot of her, her ass in a video, and that was it. And, and him claiming, you know, he had complete control of the relationship and, you know, he would only have sex with her when she was at a weight he liked and all that. And now, now this. Yeah. She completely dominated him. It's pathetic. Yeah. Oh God. Look at that. Look at this nasty one. Ugh. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a total domination and it's just, it's just totally fucking stupid. Yeah. A picture of her ass. Yeah. I remember post I posted a picture of that documentary. <laughs> It's yeah, sick. you're you're easy to dominate if you don't know who you are, because yeah. you're you're just a shell, and you're waiting for someone to give you an identity. And we see this, like we'll joke about this with people on the left, where their identity is the current thing, um, yes. but you're not immune to that that happening to you just because you're not on the left. That happens yeah. to a lot of people on the right too, and a lot of guys on the right, their their identity is constructed one evening like they, they'll still surf several channels on youtube and construct an identity and go this is now me yeah. it's not real it's not who you are you haven't been living that life yep and you, you what you have to do is see what life am i living and you have to look inside and say okay that's who i am that's what i am now do i not if i don't like it at least be honest where you are and if i don't like it this is what i'm going to do to fix it yeah and that's once a you do that, it's very hard to manipulate you because that means someone has to come and tell you to be someone that is incongruent with who you are. And as soon as they do that, you know that they're manipulating you. Yeah. Yeah. You bring up a good point that a lot of people on the right, they tend to have their identities fulfilled, filled in by other people. They're like this hollow kind of shell. And they think because like, oh, the left are hypocrites and blah, blah, blah. It's like, man, you are too. A lot of the time you don't realize it. And it's really, it's painful to watch. Like it's embarrassing to watch sometimes when I see the the right you know just kind of like a bunch of they become a bunch of zombies too sometimes right it's not just the left it's them too you'll you'll you think this way on this issue and you know this thing and the student loan thing was a good example of that to me it's complex and nuanced because it's so it's so retarded and it, the government has fucked it up so bad for so long dating back to at least 1972 when they decided to give banks special privileges to make student loans non-dischargeable in bankruptcy they gave it a special benefit that it was not deserving this then fucked up the cost of college and tuition and Republicans did jack shit about this forever, had no intention of ever fixing it. They don't give a fuck. 
So it's like, you know, you're bitching about all the student loan stuff and this forgiveness. I get it, but you're not even taking responsibility for the, for helping cause this problem and definitely doing nothing about it. A year ago, none of them would have cared at all about any of this stuff in terms of uh, updating bankruptcy code to normalize bankruptcy laws for student loans. The same way a credit card or a car payment or whatever, a car loan can be discharged in bankruptcy. Why do student loans get special? Because of this, this ridiculous bullshit where, you know, as college is like, uh, it's basically, I think, a, a it's like a child of feminism and woke. You know, st you know, education is special. We're going to give special privileges to, to student loans so more kids can get student loans and then be enslaved to this lifelong debt that you literally can't get rid of unless you get your leg blown off in Iraq. Like, that's the only time that you get rid of it is extreme yeah. hardship. Like, you're, you, got, you had a leg blown off in war. So, yeah, it's just I, it's, I, it's, it's so, so hypocritical. Many... I've had so many married 30 something year old women tell me I will never pay off my student loans in time to have killed children and like have a complete emotional breakdown yeah. in front of me. Cause they're like, I want to have kids, but I still got like 75,000 left in student loans and I'll never pay that before my fertility window runs out and I can't have kids and afford to pay the loan, the monthly yeah. payments. It yeah. is, it is serious stuff. It's changing society. It's not just about money. This is why women yeah. who go to college are basically all losers, as I see it. If you went to college, I wouldn't date her. Like, yeah. if my if well, my girl had a college degree, I would have never dated her. I want uneducated, pure blood, homeschooled woman. That's what I got. You know. Yeah. My my wife was at first, uh, you know, when I first married her, she had like a bit of an inferiority complex over the school. You know, I didn't go to college, and I, I kind of wish that I could have. And you know, right now, um, everyone she works with has way more education than her. But she's the most indispensable person. Yeah. Is it her and a bunch of other ladies? They're you know working to their friends of hers are working together to educate their kids, and they're doing it through a private school. So basically, my wife takes my kids to school, and she teaches them part of the day, and her friends teach them the rest of the day. Um, and this way, it's kind of like the old system where women of the village would get together and educate the kids in a group, uh, yeah. except she gets paid, which is great. So then she they has still, some extra. Cash. They still kind of do that in homeschool, at least in Florida. There's something called like co-op where yeah. a bunch of kids from a surrounding area that are homeschooled will go to someone's house for homeschooling that day. And it's, like, it's like five or 10 kids or something like that. I didn't even know that it existed until recently. Uh, yeah, my yeah. girlfriend was homeschooled from fifth to 12th grade, which is like mm -hmm. really unusual to find that. Yeah. Good, Otherwise, good. I would fire her, you know, get along. Well, this is part of the reason why she's, um, you, you can tell she's got that energy to her, that homeschool kid energy. She hasn't been crushed by the system. Yeah. You know? Yep. Yeah, it's um we we were mm, never mind. <laughs> I was trying to remember right. what I was, was going to say but I forgot. Sorry. Right. So talk to me uh I want to round out the I'm going to look a little bit deeper into the table of contents here. Uh you end you actually end one of the last chapters is a world without manipulation. Talk to me about that. Is that like yeah. a brighter future where we where we get rid yeah. of this fake fraudulent bullshit in the world? When we become sufficiently immune to manipulation what happens is, is we get a world where people have to self-improve to have something to offer. You know, they have to, in the free market of life, you have to offer something in order to get value because you don't have manipulation anymore as an option. That creates a high trust society where we can very quickly identify the odd person who will not conform to the no manipulation rules. You know, a lot of people talk about having laws against manipulation. Uh, that we are probably never going to enforce those, but societal pressure against it is going to be much more effective. Now imagine societies where parents don't hit the kids, they don't manipulate them, but instead they teach them how to behave and how to solve their own problems and how to live and how to think. Imagine a world where people have to admit when they have limitations and go and deal with those limitations instead of pretending they're not real. Imagine a world where we don't live in delusion anymore, but we live in reality yes. and we are, we are deeply connected with the real life, with real world. This is a world we've never experienced before. We have had higher trust societies in the past. We're actually at a low ebb for this today. Yeah. But just the way that we have suppressed violence in society, society used to be much more violent even a hundred years ago. Uh, go, even when I was a kid, society was way more violent than it is now as far as people. We, we see a lot on the news, but generally most people are not subjected to daily violence. 
200 years ago, daily violence was a normal occurrence for everyone. We are actually making some headway on encouraging parents not to beat their children. Yeah. The next frontier of improving huma humanity is reducing the amount of manipulation in the world. Yes. And just like reducing the amount of violence in the world improve their quality of life, so will reducing the amount of manipulation. It'll be a world where we can trust each other again, where we can start to believe what people say, and where we can have that kind of mutual cooperation and growth. And we don't have to keep, we don't keep getting ripped off. We don't keep wasting energy on frauds. And where it's almost impossible for our governments to trick us because we know a lie from the truth. That's the future that I want. And that's why I wrote the book. Fuck yeah. I'm all about it, man. I mean, that that is super consistent with what I believe. Uh, it's super consistent with Ayn Rand's objectivism, living in reality, and the elimination of force and fraud from society. Both need to be eliminated, not just one or the other. Both are bad. They both are, they're both the, the negation of man's mind, Ayn would say. And they yes. are. You know, whether it's direct or indirect, it doesn't really matter. They're both toxic and evil. Yeah, I love it. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading it, man. We'll get around to it before the event. Maybe you can sign sure. my copy when we meet in person. I will. Maybe depending on how many people come, I'll bring a copy for everybody. Yeah, that would be badass. Um, also, too, people should visit your website, which I think is no, it's in the description to your Twitter and your book. But your yep. website, uh, which one are you using now? SMB4K? or is um, it NoahRevoy.com, but SMB4K is still up. Uh, okay. I have to, I'm, I'm great at the coaching. I'm not so good at the marketing. I got to get somebody to condense all of my stuff and, and put it and make it work better. So I know a guy, <laughs> I had, I had this exact same problem and I had too many websites, as you may have known over the years, we had 22 convention.com, the 21 convention.com, the 21 convention.org. We had 21 studios.com, you know, blah, 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 blah down the line. It was, it was this nightmare of crap. And locally, I actually found through a mutual friend, uh, the friend of our security safety coordinator, excuse me, for our events, one of his friends actually helped me uh, compress and condense and simplify everything into one website. Basically, we said one now, 21 studioscom I will refer him, uh, you to him. He is awesome. You should definitely talk to him, in my opinion. Definitely, I will. And so you offer, just to make sure everyone knows, you also offer phone coaching and Zoom coaching and stuff, one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah, I do a lot of coaching with people one-on-one. -on -one. About a third of my clients are women, and about two-thirds are men. Uh, okay. And I'm coaching more and more married couples and married men um, because I'm, well, it's gotten so expensive that single guys can't always afford it. Um, oh. But it's, I, I'm in such high demand that uh, I had to raise my prices. I'm a, about three times this year, three times what it was at the beginning of the year now because demand has just increased. You mentioned earlier about this is the time of the manosphere. Yeah. Um, this is, people are, are desperate for help and they're looking for help. And because I do a good job, I'm busy all the time. And I, in order to balance my time out, I had to increase my rates. But uh, yeah, talk to me. The good thing is, is that it's very fast. Progress is quick when you have a good coach. Yeah. And my goal is that you don't need me forever. The idea isn't to, you know, I'm going to coach you for the next six years, like a therapist, you know, I'm going to yeah. talk about your mommy every day for you know, every week for, for six years. No, this is, you got something to solve. You come to me, we'll work on it. 12 weeks later, it's done. You never need to talk about it again. It's fixed. And that's, that's how I work with people and I work with people all over the world. So wherever you are, reach out to me and I'll tell you how we can work together. Nice. I really look forward to seeing you and Pat Stebbin meet. He has a, his coaching philosophy is almost identical uh, to what you stated in his own articulation. And that to me is yeah. a sign of a good coach and a good man. Richard Grannon, I think is very similar as well. So you yeah, might I like both those guys. Yeah, yeah, cool. Everyone, make sure you pick up a copy of, excuse me, Become Immune to Manipulation on Amazon.com. And come back to 21, meet myself, meet Noah. I'll throw the uh, ticket thing up here real quick. So like I said, Noah will be speaking at the Patriarch Convention. He'll be returning now to our events. He'll also be speaking at the 22 Convention for the females, which is right here, myself and Coach Craig. Noah is listed on the speaker down here, along with many others. Uh, Pat Stedman, I just mentioned, a couple of chicks speak at the 22, under male supervision, of course, under patriarchal rule. Anyway, come out to the events, get a freebie ticket. Well, basically, when you buy one ticket, you can bring a friend free, or a wife, or a son, or a daughter, whatever you want, as long as they're over 18. If they're under 18, they can actually attend to, but you got to be with them at all times in the conference space. Finally, a lot of you bug me about my hat. 
So if you want hats, there's a link in the description and you can get all the hats you want, or you can visit the 21 store.com. Noah, you can have as many hats as you want for free when we meet up. It's been awesome. a couple of years since I've seen you face to face. Be cool. Yeah. I'm looking, I'm uh, see if I can get an extra day on one end of the other so we can hang out a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, um, Tuesday night, you should stay through Tuesday night and leave Wednesday. Make sure we sort that out. I have, I have a over. ton of clients in Orlando, actually. Um, yeah. And in Orlando and friends in there as well. And so I'll probably stay a little while and maybe an extra week yeah. even and see all my oh, friends. Fuck yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. We just have, we have a private uh, speakers only meeting on Tuesday night. So definitely come out to that. We, I don't know if we did that. We didn't do that in Poland, but we'll do, we do it in Orlando. Yeah. Everyone else, thanks for tuning in to the Red Man Group episode 174. Do visit Noah's Twitter. Follow him there. That's growing. Visit his website, buy his book, all that fun stuff. I'll see everyone probably next Saturday on the Red Man Group and maybe a special episode before then with another speaker. Noah, thanks for your time.